and Vincent. So, uh, if you allow me, I'll just officially start. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Biljana Volchevska, project manager at Forum ZFD uh, and PhD student in the Institute for Cultural Inquiry at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. I'm really delighted to see you this evening for a discussion on cultural and po uh, cultures and politics of remembrance beyond Southeastern Europe, nationalism, transnational, transnationalism and cooperation. I would like to give uh, now the floor to Vincent Lungwitz, who is the director of the uh, Macedonian program of Forum Z uh, ZFD, uh, and just to give a little bit background about the organization and the way how this project came about. So Vincent, you would like to say a few yes, words? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Biljana. Can everybody hear me? Okay, perfect. Well, uh, and welcome also from my side. My name is Vincent Lungwitz and I'm Forum ZFD's country director for North Macedonia. Our organization initiated this conference and I would like to take the opportunity to introduce us and our conference and to extend my regards to you. Forum ZFD is part of the German government's civil peace service program that implements peace building projects in over 60 countries worldwide, funded by the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. The organization was founded in 1996 in response to the Yugoslav Wars and has worked in the region for 20 years now. In our Western Balkans program, we focus on the topics dealing with the past, peace education and inter-ethnic relations. Today's and tomorrow's uh, panel discussions are part of this year's international conference on dealing with the past, which is the fourth of its kind that Forum ZFD has organized in Belgrade Sarajevo and Pristina since 2015. There the focus was on transitional justice, while in Skopje we titled it Cultures and Politics of Remembrance in Southeastern Europe, Nationalism, Transnationalism and Cooperation, in order to adjust the conference to the local priorities regarding dealing with the past. I regret we could not meet again in person this year, but I'm very thankful to the organizing team that it was able to adjust to the COVID-19 circumstances. The Institute of National History Skopje, the Institute for Ethnology and Anthropology in North Macedonia, and especially my colleague, Biljana Wojcicka, who was the project manager for this activity. I would also like to thank all panelists for their cooperation, all pa participants via Zoom, YouTube, and Facebook for their interest, and my colleague, uh, Martin Filipowski, for his invaluable technical support. I wish us all a successful and interesting panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent. Well, as Vincent uh, mentioned, we have redesigned the conference and now uh, instead of having a physical confer conference, uh, the conference will be a combination of online activities and uh, a preparation of an edited volume. And part of the online activities are the two panel discussions that we are uh, uh, having today and tomorrow. So although the main focus of our conference is Southeastern Europe and the Balkans, today we are uh, broadening a little bit uh, the scope, uh, trying to map concepts, problems and issues of nationalism and trans transnationalism in studying, researching and teaching uh, history. Without further ado, I would like to introduce the speakers that we have today. I'll start in my virtual order, I would say, as I uh, have all of you on my uh, screen. Uh, and uh, first I have Professor Eckhart uh, Fuchs. Uh, I, ap I apologize if I, uh, please correct me if I uh, don't pronounce your name correctly. Uh, Professor Eckhart Fuchs is a research director of the Georg Eckhart Institute. Previously, he has worked as a historian at numerous academic institutions, such as the Historical Commission in Berlin, the John F. Kennedy Institute at the Free University of Berlin, the German Historical Institute in Washington, and the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. His research interest includes globalization processes in the education sector, especially those involving international organizations, global governance, education policy in Europe, the history of transnational education relationship, the global history of textbook revision, and the history of teaching materials. The next one on, uh, uh, is uh, Nenad Stefanov. 
Uh, Nenad Stefanov is a historian and research, uh, Dr. Nenad Stefanov, I'm sorry, is a historian and research assistant in the sub-project Phantom Boundaries in East Central Europe at the uh, Humboldt University in Berlin. As part of the first phase of the Phantom Border Project, he examined the constitution of borders between Serbia and Bulgaria and their effect on local so society. Under the title Across New Frontiers, Lines of Communication in the Post-Ottoman Context, Dr. Stefanov in the second funding phase asked whether and how lines of communication are changing. Using exemplary biographies of uh, merchants and civil servants, it is analyzed whether and in what form the old connections between Sofia, Plovdiv and the Ottoman capital Istanbul exist along the important Ortokol transport route. He currently holds a substitute professorship at the Chair of East and South Eastern, South uh, East European History at the University of Leipzig. Uh, then we also have uh, Professor uh, Natalie uh, Clare, uh, who is joining us from the School of Advanced Studies in the Social, uh, uh, in the social Sciences in, from Paris. Also is a senior researcher fellows at the French National Center for Scientific Research. Uh, and uh, at the Department uh, Center for Turks, Ottoman, Balkan, and Centralistic uh, Studies. The main research theme of her early work was the history of the mystical Muslim brotherhoods in the Balkans and more generally in the Ottoman Empire. She was interested for several years in questions of identity and nationalism. The news also prompted her to study Islam at the heart of post-communist transformations. As part of collective projects, she has been studying transition processes from empire to nation state. Professor Clare's research has concerned on the one hand, the political and social transformation in the last years of the Ottoman era, and on the other, the questions of religion, power, and the formation of the state in Albania of the, uh, between two wars. In recent years, uh, her work has focused on five main issues, religious pluralism, mobilization, and state formation, networks, transfers and mobility, space and biographical approaches. Uh, uh, I'm also very happy to announce uh, uh, Joanna Vavzhiniak, who's also joining us uh, today. Uh, Dr. Joanna Vavzhiniak is head of the Social Memory Laboratory at the Institute of Sociology, University of Warsaw. She is also a member of the Executive Committee of Memory Study Association. She is interested in oral history, agents of memory, economic nostalgia, and in the intellectual history of memory studies. She has been one of the conveyors of genealogies of memory in Central and Eastern Europe project at the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity since its beginnings in 2011. Her recent publications in English include Memory and Change in Europe, Eastern Perspectives, Veterans, Victims and Memory, The Politics of the Second World War in Communist Poland. Then we have The Enemy on Display, The Second World War in Eastern European Museums. She has been a visiting fellow at a number of institutions, including the New School for Social Research, the Freiburg Institute for Advanced Studies, and the Herder Institute in Marburg. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, the, uh, the next speaker is uh, uh, Kit Brown. Uh, Kit Brown currently serves, uh, if I'm correct, uh, as a director of the uh, Melikan Center, uh, Russian, Eurasian, and East European Studies. Uh, he's professor in the School of Politics and Global Studies. Previously, he was professor of research at the Thomas J. Watson Institute for International Studies at Brown University, as well as teaching in Brown's interdisciplinary undergraduate programs in international relations and development studies. He led several collaborative and policy-oriented research projects focus focusing on conflict and its aftermath, civil military relations and transitions to and from democracy. He, serves, uh, he served as a director of the Brown International Advanced Research Institute from 2010 to 2014, and director of the uh, Watson Institute's postdoctoral program and the undergraduate pub, uh, public policy program from 2014 to 2017. He has also been a senior fellow at the United States Institute of Peace and a visiting fellow at the University of uh, uh, Connecticut Humanities Institute and uh, was a, a Fulbright Fellow and the Institute of National History in Skopje, Macedonia in 2012 and uh, between 2012 and 2013. Uh, now uh, 
that we all, uh, we, uh, I have introduced the speakers, I would like right away to start with the discussion so we can have more time to discuss and later on uh, exchange uh, of, uh, involve the, the audience if, uh, if as much as we can. Uh, I would like to open up the discussion with uh, one uh, question that is more general question and it's addressed to all the speakers to the, tonight, but uh, of course uh, I, I anticipate and expect that everybody will draw from their own experience and their own research and uh, reflect from their own perspective. So the field of history is radically changing and it's changing because the world we're living is changing. We live in a world that aspires diversity as one of the highest values. In such context, transnational history is often seen as an umbrella perspective that includes a number of well-established tools and perspectives such as historical comparison, cultural transfers, connections, circulations, entangled or shared histories. However, in the context of in a European cooperation, we are witnessing various processes in which the nation-centered historical domains are gaining or regaining relevance in the public discourse. Can these two perspectives co coexist? And if yes, how would that look, uh, especially in regions where history can be highly contested with numerous un outstanding unresolved historical disputes? Uh, I would like to uh, uh, invite uh, Professor Fuchs. He's the first one uh, that I see if to reflect on this first question. Uh, if you could just turn on the microphone because we cannot hear you. Okay, thank you very much for reminding me. Okay, I'm, I'm starting again. Thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction and for inviting me to this uh, exciting uh, uh, conference uh, tonight. Uh, I would like to add one more thing to my biography. Uh, I'm here today, I think, as a as a historian who has done a transnational history, so to speak. But I'm also here as a director of an institute uh, that deals with textbooks and education and media, which is uh, has been and still is very much involved in trans and international activity. So I'm basically on a theory side and on a practical side, and um, I will come back to that a little bit later. Well, the first question is a, is a, is a complex question and not easy to answer because it brings together two areas. It brings together the area of historical research on the one hand, uh, and the area of public discourse on history and memory on the other hand. And these are two different realms. And uh, so I want to address both of them first separately, and then I might be able to bring that uh, together. Uh, first again, then the, the, the uh, realm of historical research. Um, the term transnational itself was coined more than 100 years ago in the United States, but the uh, debate on transnational history uh, uh, only started like about two decades ago. It started first in the US and then it spread over over to, over to, to Europe. And it eventually then, uh, probably like 15 years ago, it led to what we call in historical sciences, uh, the transnational turn. So what is a transnational turn? The transnational turn, and that's very important to understand, is an approach to historical phenomena, an approach rather than a theory or a unique methodology. Uh, so it can be applied, this approach can be applied to any, any kind of historical research, be it political history or cultural history or economic history, um, intellectual history, uh, you, you name it. And the second point that's very important, besides the fact that it is an approach and not, not, not a theory, uh, it, it does not replace a national approach and approach in, in, in historical research, but it adds on uh, to national perspective by investigating, and you have said it in your question already, investigating the entanglements, the connections, the transfers, uh, uh, activities between nations and, and, and other uh, um, entities, regions uh, uh, or, or places. So it explains why certain phenomena in history uh, became international or transnational without neglecting, in most cases, national specifics. So the transnational and the national is not; these are not opposite terms, but they they add on. They are linked. They are linked. Uh, and when we look at historical research in in the past decades, of course, we still have national approaches uh, with certain methodologies, and we have a transnational perspective, basically, as you said in the beginning, as 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 an as an umbrella 
perspective, so to speak. Uh, so if you look at nationalism today, so a transnational perspective can, for instance, uh, uh, explain for different phases in history, including, including the present, why there's a rising nationalism, because a rising nationalism is nothing new in history, of course, and transnational activities are not new either. Um, so a rising nationalism in whatever period of time uh, uh, we talk about does not automatically mean that transnational relations or entanglement, entanglements are decreasing only because there's an increasing nationalism. That's I think that's very important to understand. First of all, these are not opposite approaches uh, um, uh, on the one hand. On, on the other hand, if you see a phenomenon on the one hand, it doesn't mean that the other hand vanishes or decreases or, or something like that. That's I could, I could say a lot about like transnational research uh, agendas, but I leave it uh, uh, with that for now and come to the second level, the public discourse on nationalism. Nationalism in my view per se is nothing, if I use a moral term, is nothing bad per se. Um, because we live in the historical age uh, and stage of nation state for the past uh, 250 years, the nation states are, uh, define themselves through national history. The nation is in many ways uh, still the point um, of departure for identity building. That's, that's a fact and we cannot neglect, neglect that. However, and that's my point, the nation-centered discourse, which is per se not, not bad, as I said, can be uh, turned into a nationalistic one. And this is the rising phenomenon we observe today, not a national, or nationalism discourse, but a nationalistic one, which becomes, of course, much uh, uh, stronger. And, and we have to be very much um, uh, concerned with that in the field of memory. I'm not an expert in memory studies, but it's even called history wars. And, and in the region we are talking about, we, we see and observe this kind of history wars um, every day. So these nationalistic views are value-based and not evidence-based, but they have strong political aims that need to be reconsidered. So what can historians now, switching between the historians, so the research field and this public debate on memory on, on the past, which is, as you said in the beginning, uh, highly contested, not only in this region, but in many, many parts of the world, uh, what can and should historians do with a transnational perspective and with a transnational, transnational approach? Well. I think it concerns every historian. Every uh, historian as an expert needs to get involved in endorse nationalistic public debates by disclosing the motives and values of such nationalistic discourses by providing evidence and methodologically founded explanations. That is very important and in many uh, uh, um, um, places of the world, you know, historians, very often say, well, we are experts, we have our field, but we are not very much engaged in those public discourses, but this is, is really needed. So it's not only historians who do transnational history, but it's a general responsibility of all historians and, and not only the ones when we talk about transnational history. So to end up, uh, transnational history as an approach in rising national public, uh, public discourses, they are not a paradox to answer your question. In, in my, my view, they are just different realms. They have to meet, and I think with the expertise of historians, no matter if they do transnational history or national history, as professional and experts, they have to interfere with this very nationalistic public discourse, as I said, that we observe in many parts of the world and not only in Europe. Thank you very much. Now we cannot hear you. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, reflecting on. Uh, yeah, I'm very glad actually to hear that, that they both of them can coexist, although uh, maybe in the, in the future, in, in the next, uh, 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 when the next speakers speak, I also would like to hear what are the advantage or disadvantage when one is dominating uh, before the other, what kind of questions are missed when a research question might not be addressed at all, when we, when we are preferring only national history uh, and, and, and what kind of um, yeah, other perspectives are being open to transnational history that can actually have maybe, maybe too, uh, too optimistic from my side, but maybe can bring some positive social change even, I don't know. I would like to move to uh, uh, Nenad, uh, who uh, also works uh, directly with borders and phantom borders. Uh, the, the project, which I find it very interesting. Uh, 
Go ahead. Yes, um, thank you very much also for the invitation. Um, we should have, I should have been in Ohrid uh, these days uh, because we should have had um, a summer school, but uh, due to the um, situation, you know, I'm not in Ohrid, I'm now in Piran in Slovenia. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit um, uh, disappointed uh, out of that, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm really glad that we, have, we can discuss here together. Um, just one thing, uh, Phantom Borders, we, we um, um, the project um, is uh, closed and we have now, I'm um, coordinating a cent interdisciplinary center uh, crossing borders at HU Berlin uh, now, but dealing again with borders, not only with phantoms, but with real borders also and bordering and the uh, limitations uh, concerning societies. And this was also what I thought about, I reflected on your and your question was um, um, the societal dimension uh, of what you uh, asked. And um, I, I just, I mean, we have to, to consider, of course, that um, history, particularly history was always also a legitimation science of power. I mean, history served in all societies, be it in Western Europe, be it in Eastern Europe, uh, legitimizing power, legitimizing it by telling the story. Um, and um, particularly, we had this also in this authoritarian uh, system of uh, socialist Yugoslavia, but there, especially also with this particular uh, spaces of, how to say, um, uh, yes, a critical reflection, there was also a counterpart, a let's say cosmopolitic approach towards history, which is, um, I mean, close to a transnational um, um, approach. So this tension, I think it is in cha changing um, uh, forms present um, the whole time, but what the specific was, was that by the wars for ethnic homogeneous ter territories, uh, this kind of um, approach of legitimizing power of nationalist history was even more um, um, amplified in the several uh, following states of uh, former Yugoslavia. And um, this is something which until now seems to be dominating. But I wanted to point out something else. It's not only about the academic discourse I I uh, think we should take care of, but there is also another aspect. And this is for me connected to a rise of authoritarian attitudes at the end of the 1980s, particularly in Serbia as the avant-garde of this kind of authoritarianism or populism we can also um, observe today in other parts of the world. And um, what then happened, um, was that it's not only a sci an academic discourse, but um, um, history was suddenly supposed in this 1987 period, 1989, um, to provide answers to all social questions beyond the academic discourse. Yeah, and. Um, um, it, it uh, uh, had to answer who is guilty for the crisis, um, um, where comes the economic misery from, who is to blame, why we have always been victims. I mean, um, this, um, this was a part of the discourse of Serbian nationalism, but it also was then transferred to the other parts of Yugoslavia. It was um, also very present there. So, and um, history uh, serves to, to explain every day, day life and um, everyday problems. And um, uh, in, uh, in Germany, uh, in sociology, that if Clausen had coined uh, the uh, notion everyday religion, Alltagsreligion, and history is transferred to some kind of everyday religion. Um, so departing from this academic sphere and um, something we see today in social networks, this is not a coherent ideology anymore as 
this classical legitimation uh, science history, but it is, uh, there are fragments of um, conspiracy theory. There are um, the self-victimization. This Kosovo myth is also can be also described from this uh, point of view. So um, we have something um, that sociologists would have uh, called in former times non-public opinion, where this kind of um, perceiving society, societal crisis by history. And I think this should we also uh, uh, consider when we are dealing with the academic discourse that we now have some kind of interference, interrelationship between this academic discourse, which is fed by this prejudices and this um, dispositions in the society and is again feeding this kind of dispositions, the societal dispositions. And this is something we should, we should reflect on when we are talking also about the academic sphere. So this for the first question, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, it seems we're going to talk a little bit more about this, this, uh, the two realms of academic and uh, public discourse. Also, uh, Eckhart has brought that up. Uh, but uh, Natalie, uh, what is uh, your take on on this? Yes. Uh, so, thank you also for the invitation to participate to this debate. Um, I think that uh, what I wanted to uh, to give as an answer is uh, um, crossing the the previous answers because um, first I wanted to um, say that in your question I was a bit embarrassed by this uh, opposition between so the uh, uh, the sphere of the uh, the academic sphere, the, the sphere of the historians or history making uh, people, and on the other hand, the um, the society and the public discourses. Because I think that it's not so easy to oppose them as far as the uh, uh, the the approaches transnational uh, versus uh, nation-centered uh, approaches are concerned. So uh, I think that, that it was already said the, um, that, and maybe I want to, uh, to stress this, that uh, everywhere, uh, not only in the Balkans, but in the academic spheres, not only the nation, I don't speak about the national approach, but the nationalist approach is also present. Um, and so it's not nationalism is not uh, the, um, the, the um, uh, specific to the public discourses or in the public discourses, you have also discourses of the historians. And on the other hand, uh, in the public discourses, you, so you have not only one public discourse, you have many public discourses. And maybe, so maybe, and here there is this notion of dominance. You, you, uh, you said maybe we should uh, uh, have a look at uh, uh, what is dominant or not. Okay, so maybe in some places at certain moment, the uh, nationalism is uh, dominant in the public discourses, no but also in the Balkans, uh, there are public discourses uh, that are uh, civic, uh, that are also uh, representing other groupings. So not only uh, the uh, nation, they are not only nation centered, but maybe also regional centered, also local centered, also professional centered, etc. etc. So maybe they are not so dominant, but they are also present. So we 
we, we should be aware of this uh, uh, multiplicity. Uh, second, uh, maybe something that uh, was uh, not addressed in the first uh, answers is the uh, the importance because Nenad stressed this uh, the the, uh, uh, the period of the end of uh, the uh, communist regime in the Balkans, but of course also the uh, uh, the issue of uh, of Europe of the of the European Community and and uh, its problems <laughs> uh, and also globalization. Yes, plays uh, they they play a role in uh, also in the uh, emergence of uh, uh, maybe more nation centered uh, uh, discourses and way also to make history. So both, uh, but um, but I think that here again. Uh, one should also see maybe continuities. So these uh, trends are not totally new. So what uh, said Nenad was uh, 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 an example. They are not totally new. And so they, they are nourished also by previous way of uh, uh, expressing uh, such uh, um, views, uh, opinions. But these views and opinions, nation-centered, are re-articulated uh, uh, in relation with the new context. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it is also, so uh, as uh, uh, Professor Fuchs uh, uh, underlined, so we have often uh, kind of uh, um, trends that are coupled so uh, and uh, when you have identity you have alterity when you have uh, globalization you have also uh, a re uh, configuration of uh, uh, of identities at uh, uh, other levels so and my third point is uh, so should we uh, should the nation uh, uh, or the an, um, an history uh, made at the level of the nation or should nation or the nation states be abandoned as uh, objects of history for the historians? No, so it was already said. Uh, no, on the contrary, so they are to be taken very seriously. Uh, so, uh, but parallelly to also to a transnational approaches to local approaches. So uh, not every process, for example, is uh, situated at the transnational level or translocal. Uh, so, uh, and I will come back to, to this later. I think that uh, the level of the and the, the existence, uh, it was said, the, 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 the very existence of, uh, of the idea of nations and, uh, and uh, of nation states are to be uh, taken very seriously and to be studied by historians. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I also hope we'll have uh, more time to return to, to the questions that you opened and the points that you made. And um, I, I couldn't agree more that, uh, the, that it's irrelevant to talk about na uh, nation states history. However, my question, I would say, is still remain, and I totally agree that there are even so uh, initiatives, marginalized stories, voices, memories, but then the question comes in which framework are they vocalized when we have a history textbooks when they only talk about national histories military militarized history uh, and there is hardly at least i'm talking in the context where i'm coming from where basically the balkans uh, th then is uh, uh, the question how do we uh, 
but we can come back, I hope, again uh, to this question. But this, I think, is a nice transition to uh, Joanna, who is actually coming from memory studies and maybe can reflect a little bit also on the interdisciplinarity of, of history and, and what is what can memory studies do for it. Yeah, yeah well, my, my background is sociology and history, but I try to present myself uh, as a memory scholar. And in what I'm going to say, I would try to combine these three perspectives by trying to, and I hope my, co my colleagues, the historian colleagues will forgive me that for a moment, by trying to understand history as a form of memory. It can be the so-called cold memory, as Jan Asman has called it, but still it's, a, it's one of the representations and collective representations of, um, of the past we might have. Uh, that's one thing. But the other, I think, it's in the discussion we are having, it's, it's, it would be great to ask a kind of the sociological question. <laughs> who is making transnational history and who is benefiting from the transnational turn and who is benefiting from the, uh, who is writing national histories and who is benefiting from the, uh, from this kind of, of the turn. So kind to look at the agencies, the real agencies right now uh, in Europe and beyond uh, who benefits from this uh, different kind of discourses they propose. So with transnational history, I think it's the answer is quite simple. It is being um, written and being made by um, highly educated multi-language uh, multi scholars um, uh, who can travel and benefit from, uh, from, from that kind of the intellectual exercise, which is uh, transnational turn. And then who can benefit from the, uh, from the national history? Mainly the local historians who find their own publics locally. And I think that is even more kind of important right now in the margins of Europe where I'm based. <laughs> and so when I spoke to, uh, uh, when I had Petr, Petr saying about the problems in Skopje right now, and I can, I, we, we are having exactly the same in Warsaw with uh, this clash of discourses. So part of the, uh, of the elite, also of the intellectual elite aspiring to that cosmopolitan transnational discourse and part of them uh, pretending to stay with and reinvent the more familiar uh, national discourses. So that's, uh, this I think it's a kind of, the, as I said, sociological question we might ask about the agencies behind this uh, two types of historiographies, which are both professional historiographies, but they, they might also become the public history, and they are somehow transferred via uh, foundations, associations, museums, and all this kind of the work into the, um, uh, into the, into that what we call public, uh, public history. So then we can also ask what is attractive, right, in uh, both transnational and national history. And I was mainly concentrating in, in my exercise about that, about what is really attractive in national history today. So, and so why we are actually facing that national, uh, the national regaining an impotence right now. So one thing it's, as I think it's obvious, it's familiarity of the national discourse. So you do have you, even if the national is constantly reinvented, <laughs> you do use some uh, traditions and most importantly, the language uh, with uh, which you have already worked with. It's also kind of the search of the usable past in the time of globalization, in the time of the uncertainty when people do prefer to hold to that what they know better. Um, but the more important answer, I think it is that national history gives that what the cosmopolitan transnational history doesn't give to the people, which are the emotions and passions. <laughs> and there is this beautiful model recently developed by Anna Cento Bull and Hans Christian Locke. After, uh, after the Chantal move, they transfer her idea into memory studies and they propose to look on the, um, and that what's being done with the memories in the public sphere in the terms of cosmopolitan antagonistic and agonistic form of memory. So they would say that this transnational discourse, it's a cosmopolitan kind of the discourse which 
um, is based on, first of all, on the human rights discourse, human rights discourse. it's victim-centered, but it's in a way called uh, in the sense that it doesn't really um, understand or uh, somehow interplays with the patient, uh, passions and emotions involved uh, in the history making underground. So into that, they, uh, with this kind of the cosmopolitan discourse, they, uh, mm, uh, they contrapose to that the uh, the agonistic discourse of national histories, which they usually very much <laughs> emotion driven and very often very agonistic because, you know, these nationalistic discourses, they often need enemies and, and things, uh, things like this. And they, they do also propose uh, this sad concept, which is the concept of agonism. And we might come back to that later because this is actually the solution <laughs> To, uh, uh, to, to the problem because they see, they, they look for a balance be between the cosmopolitan and uh, agonistic uh, memories of, uh, of today. So, uh, yeah, and finally, I think that the, the point which I really would like to make that this nationalistic turn is, is, is something which is a language of expression for the local elite, for the local elite which will not find it's itself in this big, big cosmopolitan or transnational sea. And you know, there is this saying that it's better to be a big fish in a small pond than a small fish in the big pond, right? So when we have this national revival in which public historians and professional historians very often participate on in the countries as, uh, at least of eastern uh, of eastern southeastern europe it is because they do not always find themselves heard enough in this transnational realm of history so i think i can finish with that point right now and perhaps later come back to some of it yes um Thank you. That kind of uh, sociological reflection could uh, could be very useful in, in understanding um, the boat in terms of uh, which purpose they might serve or whose whose agendas they they, they might fit. Um, I I was wondering as we are hearing as trans, I, I for my own understanding transnational is usually understood as something uh, looking from maybe distance or from some kind of broader connections, but that. Actually, it's not always the case. It can be a very, uh, very concrete, very some one connection between one kind of uh, dynamics happening between between agents in history, and that kind of micro perspectives can can have transnational character and can bring uh, can give voice to a historical agents that haven't had any voice previously, and that's why actually, uh, Kit, actually, uh, you you had if I'm not mistaken, such approach in one of your previous research, it's, it's not necessarily transnational, but it is a micro approach. When you go very, you zoom in into, it was the, the Vefchani, right, uh, research. And I, and you brought up something that Macedonia historians, I would, I never heard been interested in such issues. And that, some, that brought up, uh, that brings to, to light some kind of historical events. Uh, that are very, very different in the way they're told from how we learn about in history books. Uh, uh, Kit, uh, I would uh, give uh, now the floor to you. Uh. Uh, thank you, Biliana. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I, uh, <laughs> what a great introduction you gave me. So I, um, yeah, just to, to add to the generous introduction you gave me, I realized that bio I wrote uh, when I was still very much in, um, thinking about the things that uh, I did over 20 years at uh, Brown. Now, uh, didn't actually prop, crop up in my um, bio. I'm actually at Arizona State University. Um, that's where the Malikian Center is. I'm directing a center there. And I took the liberty of, of just preparing a slide for each of my three pieces. Um, and in all, in all three pieces, I'll be, uh, as, as Biliana said, I, I tried to I am very much interested in the micro approach. And so the way that I respond to the paradox as we framed it right now is to sidestep it um, or, or 
work out a way to bring the local into engagement with the global. And one way that the local that engages with the global is through the um, container of the nation state and nationalism. But that's a very um, historically contingent and specific uh, way of articulating between local and global, which people have said it's it's been around for 250 years. Uh, and I would say, yes, it's, it's only been around for 250 years. Um, that's not a very long time in, uh, in, in the great span of things. So uh, what I've done, I just uh, responded to the three questions just by, I want to flag three, um, three cases, three micro studies, and just talk very concretely about these questions. Um, and so this is, um, uh, this map is an artifact, um, which is sort of my effort as a um, um, social science grounded historian to actually um, provide a new way of reading a short, um, a short text from the French archives, um, where the vice consul in Skopje, Max Chublin, uh, just gave the gave an inventory of the weapons that had been seized by Ottoman authorities on their way to the Macedonian Revolutionary Organization in 1903. And so uh, there was quite a bewildering array of weapons mentioned. Um, and it got me thinking uh, out beyond that nation state again, where, where, does, where does the Macedonian Revolutionary Organization in 1903, between 1893 and 1903, get its weapons from? Uh, because if you're, a, if you're an armed insurgency, you better be armed. Um, so anyone who's uh, looked at lo lo uh, Loyal Unto Death um, maybe remembers this story. I uh, just want to add a little bit to it and flag the keywords that I responded to uh, Biliana's invitation to think about some of the terms that are important in our own research. Um, so the particular weapons that I've been tracking most faithfully um, are the Martinis, um, and partic in particular the Peabody Martinis, um, which, uh, which were represented in this weapons cache. And it turned out, um, I learned as I kind of dug around, and I, I, I accept the commentary that um, it is, we have the privilege and the luxury to dig around, but I also find the, um, the leveling effect of um, so much material now being available online and so many uh, rabbit holes being available to us uh, from our own desks uh, that I'm not sure that it's, it's, it's necessarily only the case that being in the US I get the chance to delve into these things. Uh, so the Peabody Martinis that ended up uh, as part of a weapons cache uh, uncovered by the Ottoman authorities and written about by a French consul in 1903 uh, were built in Providence, uh, Rhode Island, um, and were shipped to the Ottoman Empire as part of a, um, a, an arms order for 600,000 rifles placed by the Ottoman Empire um, as they were modernizing. And it's a particularly, for me, it's a very compelling story because it takes a, it's, it, it's made possible by the, um, by the overextension of the arms industry in the United States and particularly small companies in the Northeast uh, who were supplying the Union Army during the Civil War and with the end of the U US Civil War suddenly found themselves with excess production on their hands. Um, and for the next 20 or 30 years, while some of those companies uh, transformed their production lines to, uh, other, uh, to produce other things, a few of them got involved in the international arms trade. And so we've got this really, for me, interesting story of a Providence businessman and a small, uh, what was a small Providence company uh, in New England, uh, landing this huge deal uh, with the um, Ottoman army, uh, the, the, Ottoman, the Ottoman Imperial Army. And the sort of pathway of who the brokers were, who the middlemen were, uh, what what happened with the freight? What happened with the finances? Um, is is for me a sort of way of looking at history, where we put objects at the center. Um, and in this particular case, we tell a story about um, the end of an empire um, and the use 
of weapons originally bought by that empire by internal uh, internal forces committed to destroying that empire. That is the Macedonian Revolutionary Organization, um, the, the Albanian National Movement uh, made extensive use of these Pibori Martinis. A lot of them ended up in the hands of um, Arabs and Arab allies of the British during World War I, again used against the Ottoman Empire. So you see this kind of escape, uh, the way that objects escape the purpose of the agents that uh, put them into circulation in the first place. Um, to, to, so, so to enable us to draw from some of the theoretical discourses happening outside history, um, especially those that, as I said, put uh, write the history of objects um, or, or, or look at the, 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 the production chains and uh, distribution flows and the financial flows around those objects as a way to, for me, sort of break through this impasse. Because for me, this is, this is a much more interesting, compelling and intimate story of what the Macedonian Revolutionary Organization was up to than um, the assumption that the Macedonian Revolution Organization, the, the only thing that the Macedonian Revolution Organization cared about was that in a hundred years, a political party would be celebrating its legacy as, as the, the, the birth uh, or, or the, the consolidation of national consciousness. So there's a way to sort of get past, I think the, the sort of ideas and emotions that, um, that, political elites try to mobilize uh, in different publics and bring publics together um, in, the, in the modern world and actually reach past that fog um, and actually get people interested in what actually happened. Um, and for me, objects, object flows are, a, are, are one way to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kit, for this uh, great presentation. It was very interesting, actually, and uh, uh, very interesting to, to know and I uh, never heard about it before. Um, if you allow me now, I would um, like to move to uh, now. Yes, uh, Fuchs uh, has the question, I think. I'm not quite sure, are we, are we entering a discussion right now? Are, are we doing the three rounds? I would really like to say something about Joanna's contribution and okay, that's one I mean but I don't know we can postpone the discussion after we have uh, no I, 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 I questions think, whatever the, uh, no I I, yeah. I think we shouldn't stop the flow so if uh, there is need for discussion we should definitely discuss uh, so please go ahead and then uh, we'll move slowly to the next question okay thank you very much uh, I found uh, uh, you know the contributions very interesting and especially uh, Joanna, what you said uh, from your sociological perspective, you know, the differentiation between professional historians uh, who are the elite and are cosmopolitan because they are, they can and have the, the means uh, to, to travel and to do the transnational. So they do transnational history and they practice transnational history because they can. And, and then the local historians um, um, who bring up uh, with national history, the emotions and, and, and passions. I find it very interesting. I haven't, I haven't really thought in that perspective. Uh, I, but th there are two things I, I think I want to add to that. The first, uh, I think, and uh, there are a lot of local historians who do transnational history. That I want to, so we have a lot of, uh, not a lot, but, but many examples uh, where really on a very local level, and it was said before, on a very local level, you know, they look at those transnational, whatever activities, uh, uh, Keith just mentioned objects that, you know, were transferred from here to there. Uh, so, so I don't know if this, if, if this really uh, is the differentiation between the transnational and, and national approach. But, but my other point is, uh, since you talked about agency, I think uh, when we talk about public discourse, there's a third and fourth agency. And, 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 and I have the feeling that uh, those third and fourth agency, and I will name them in a second, that they are dominating this public discourse. Of, this course, of course, now we should talk about what do we understand on a public discourse. Maybe we have, of course, all, all of us different opinions about it because of course, professional historians participate in public discourse too. But I think 
what you have in mind with your conference is some kind of other public uh, discourse. So what I have in mind uh, is laymen and politicians. And if I look at you know these these contested contested debates, um, um, uh, uh, then I see in those discourses, and especially on on the internet, but also in other media, that laymen claim that they know better about the history, right? From their own experience or whatever, from their political opinions, whatever. So they go out there and they claim certain things, uh, but they don't have, let's let's put it that way, and I don't wanna sound arrogant, they don't have expert knowledge, but they bring it in. And of course, in, in, in especially in, in social media, they have a huge influence, right? And where are we as historians, no matter if we do his, um, uh, um, national or transnational history. And the other ones are politicians. Uh, they bring up, you know, of course, we know how much they shape memory politics. That's why it's called memory politics. But they are in a public discourse. And, and if I look around and say, who listens to me and who listens to uh, politicians when it comes to the interpretation of history and how you make it dominant in a discourse, then I would say my role is very much limited for several reasons. But, in, in, but my point is basically to empower, uh, you know, historians, no matter if they are local historians or let's say, professional transnational historians as you framed it. Uh, so these, these two other uh, uh, um, agencies or, or actors, uh, laymen um, of all kinds and politicians, they need to be considered when we talk about like this contested public discourse or the you know contesting um, history interpretations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Iker. Does anybody else wants to comment or add something uh, to this? Can I just briefly answer? Yeah. Just very briefly. Yeah. Thank you yeah, so yeah, much. Yeah, sure. <laughs> because it develops the framework. So obviously I do agree with your first point. I was just too simplistic. Uh, you know, with this five minutes, I, I know I need to stick to the time. But yes, obviously. So we, we can complicate. I mean, from, in especially I would say on the fringes of Europe, there is this now this interesting generational turn because there is now the new generation of uh, historians educated at several Western universities coming back and kind of combining, you know, the, the skills and knowledge. So, that, you know, there's plenty of ways we can look at that. But still, I would argue that there is a tension between maybe not national, but nationalistic turn and the transnational turn. And they are, we can look for some key agents uh, of those discourses um, around, uh, around Europe. And yes, the second, the second point, absolutely also fully agree. I was also thinking, you know, about this European project term, which perhaps might be even better than laymen, which is stakeholders. <laughs> Who are the stakeholders of the, um, of the historical discourse who are not necessarily trained historians, but, uh, but history is important for them to express, say, identities. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you. Anybody else? wants to add something? No, okay, then, uh, uh, well, uh, I'll move to the second question. Um, it's about historical uh, revisionism, uh, which perceived in its narrow uh, scope is a process imminent to history as a science, and that's immune to norm normative interpretations. However, from a wider socio-political perspective, this process attributes meaning to various public discourses, events, and meanings. In the Balkans, for example, it happens often that authorities are all uh, tenaciously engaged in shaping memory. They adopt a cherry-picking and identity-driven approach in molding memory politics in revisionist fashion. Uh, what is your take on this? Can we conduct a clear-cut history-memory distinction in these regards? And I must add to this from the discussion that I'm hearing now, we, we hear on one side that, na uh, that national history coexists with transnational history, or there is a, pot pot there is a potential for that, and they, they're not opposing each other. However, on the other side, the way history is being taught for, for, century, uh, for centuries, it, it's very much, at least in the Balkans, 19th century kind of way of telling history. Is there a need or, is it maybe too strong the word for a paradigm shift in uh, in the ways how history is being taught? And uh, uh, do you think there, there needs to be a radical change? Okay, we need to change the ways how we are teaching history, how we are presenting history, especially to the youth. 
and uh, this just came now as, as inspiration for me we're hearing here uh, the discussion so far so and when is revisionism uh, kind of an um, an absolute risk that needs to be taken when we have to kind of restudy some some things or see them from a different perspective and when is actually a dangerous kind of realm when it's taken in the hands by politicians and uh, um, and it can be misused so I, I'm sorry if I opened up too many questions. I, uh, I hope you can all pick up on at least part of it uh, or some aspects of the things that I just said. Um, uh, Eckhart, since you are actually uh, very much engaged with textbooks and have done a lot of research, but also working directly with, with the institutes uh, on, on these topics, could you please say something about, or about your experience at this? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Of, of course, I don't, I don't, I don't want to focus the whole discussion on, on, on textbooks, but what you just pointed out is, is in my view, a very, very port, important as, aspect because uh, shaping memory and education are, are very, very deeply interwoven. When I talk about education, then about, of course, the, uh, the material uh, that is used in schools or for education in, in general that have to do with, with history. And I mean, you're, you're your judgment that for centuries, or maybe not, not that long, but let's say for the past 150, 50 years, that the national narrative is the central part of history textbooks, that, that has not changed. And why shouldn't students in Germany not learn about German history, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But, and here comes, comes the big, big but. Textbooks, of course, um, um, are carriers knowledge uh, that one generation wants to basically um, um, carry on on to the next one and the content and norms uh, included uh, in, in textbooks uh, uh, are normally a result of negotiation process in a society and here it comes because you your question of course mentions authorities uh, education in, in all countries in this world as far as I know are still a matter of governments there are ministries of education or other political stakeholders who have a very very strong influence uh, on the contents of what is taught in, in schools and especially in, in, in history class. Um, yet, uh, in many societies and many countries, this is not like done by the Ministry of Education or by a president of a country, but as I said, by negotiation process. And decisive for this process is um, that is based on democratic values and standards. So basically, all stakeholders that have to do with education have to be heard. Everybody has a has a saying. There are commissions, committees that negotiate uh, the contents uh, um, um, of textbooks. And what you said is right, but of course, in the past, I would say maybe two decades, or maybe a little bit shorter, we see a shift in many countries when it comes to to the way in which history is is, is taught in schools and uh, we call it of course uh, you know multi perspectivity and, and 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 things like that i don't want to go into that but what is most important is we are not going to and i don't think that should be done a change a a a national or national based a narrative but what should back textbooks do is they should allow different interpretations, uh, other views from other countries. Uh, we have a lot of textbook conflicts between two countries, sometimes are more, but it's, it's between two, where, where basically one country doesn't even, or students doesn't even know that students in the other country have another perspective and why. So this needs to be incorporated in, in, in those textbooks. And I think in many countries we're on a, on a, on a good way. Certainly not, not, not in Macedonia and, 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 and uh, uh, and in, in Greece and in other areas in, in, in southern in southern Europe. So what I what I mean here is that authorities or political stakeholders are part of it, and they cannot be excluded. Uh, for my for the third question, then I have some answers to that. Here I, I just leave it with a statement. So we cannot exclude it, and they don't have to be excluded. What is very important is that authorities uh, basically allow allow a variety of interpretations and can tolerate it. That's very important. And where you have countries where this is not the case uh, for whatever reasons, where they don't allow um, uh, the plurality of historical uh, narratives or, or, or memories, then of course it's very problematic. There are ways to do it, but that's your third question. So I'm, I'm gonna say a little bit more about it a bit about it later. But here again, my argument is a recontextualization of a national history in textbooks. It's possible, but in most countries of the world or in many countries of the world, it has not happened yet because of a very strong political influence, an influence that 
does exclude uh, other yeah um agents in society thank you thank you thank you for that um uh, i will move now to natalie um natalie what uh, I, I just uh, if you could just switch your uh, microphone yes yes yeah. yeah. okay um uh, yes i think that uh, if we take uh, the example of uh, France, uh, a country where the, uh, let's say, the populists uh, are not uh, yet uh, uh, um, leading the, uh, the country. So here also we see that, uh, and it, it, it's like that, the, uh, the, the Political leaders are shaping the uh, the public memory. It's um, it's a, a common process. So I recently uh, uh, was hearing at uh, TV. Uh, it was uh, two days ago, and uh, there was a, a reportage about the uh, Macron in the last uh, month uh, and is is. Uh, action in shaping uh, very much the uh, himself the the public memory so not speaking about the the textbooks uh, so um so i i think that we don't need to go to uh, to countries where there are authoritarian regime to uh, to see such uh, things but maybe there are differences and uh, uh, and in maybe in France, we can say that uh, still uh, critical thinking, because I think that, that not only the multiplicity, but also the, um, uh, the apprenticeship of uh, critical thinking, it's also very, very important uh, in, uh, uh, for the education of... Uh, of, of uh, people. So um, maybe, uh, so, so to, to when, when I prepare the answer to, to, to this question, uh, I wanted also to speak about this uh, triangular relation between so political leaders, uh, historians and public opinion in shaping memory, but maybe we, uh, I just thought that we are forgetting also uh, family memories and family and uh, individual memories because, so education, it's school is very important, uh, obviously, but also the, the still the family, maybe also the, the social networks, but, uh, um, uh, uh, and here, it's it's also maybe in introducing family memories that uh, uh, we can uh, think about, in fact, the de facto existing multiplicity. But maybe with this um, problem of uh, hierarchy and uh, of uh, the, the do dominance, and uh, uh, but so it's uh, I'm just uh, <laughs> giving you this idea, and in fact it was to answer this question that I wanted to tackle the uh, uh, the issue that uh, Johanna uh, already tackled, so the uh, the sociological dimension. So. Uh, uh, Thinking about the um, the revisionist e historians, who are there? All the other ones, the, even if I I don't agree really with this uh, dichotomy between uh, revision revisionist and uh, uh, on the other side uh, uh, transnational uh, uh, historians. Uh, but so I I. I I had also the impression that uh, it was a bit too uh, simplistic, this opposition between the 
the intellectual uh, cosmopolitan and uh, um, traveling uh, all around and the other one S but but i think that if um, that uh, definitely uh, we have to try to understand who so the agencies as you said uh, Johanna, and who is having uh, uh, which position and why but in uh, i think that um, the problem is what are their constraints, their uh, possibilities, uh, their personal views, maybe their sensibility, because it's also very personal, sometimes very uh, personal issue, their social po positioning and their political positioning. So it's, it's uh, uh, far more complex. That's what I wanted to, to say. Uh, thank you, Natalie. Uh, Joanna, do you want to continue uh, and also add your uh, thoughts on this? No, just going back to Natalie, I totally agree with you that we can find the complicated, and that's uh, thank you for uh, for that because I fully 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 agree with it. Um, coming maybe to your initial question. Uh, well, first of all, you know, sometimes I'm <laughs> being a professional historian and as such, I would to keep politicians far away from <laughs> what I'm doing. But I mean, they always, I think, you know, it, that would, it's deplorable that they do that, but they have to do, they, they, they have always done it and they will always do that. So we just have to live with that. And I think that happens in uh, most of the country of the world. That there is kind of the memory politics or history policy history politics, you could name it as you will. As there is welfare policy, as there, there is economic policy, you know, as there are some other politics. But the question is how to organize it, right? And that's what has been already said by uh, my predecessors, that it's good to have it organized in a way that it's multi-perspective. But it's, uh, in a way, easy to say. <laughs> it's easier to organize in certain countries and in some countries as ours, <laughs> it, uh, it it becomes really difficult. So even after the, like Poland is an example that there has been, or there was a kind of the big attempt to reorganize the history education uh, in such a way that it becomes, that the country becomes more, or the students become more aware of the, let's say, multinational origins of the state in which they live, which has been totally nationalized by the communist propaganda, paradoxically, after the 1945. So, you know, myself, when I was like in, in a school in the 19, like a small kid in the 1980s in the school, I would not know that the um, Western territories where I go but German, you know, that was something which was uh, hidden down. The Holocaust stories, you know, that's another threat which has been um, Always, but the Ukra uh, Ukraine, uh, Belarusia, Lithuania, you know, we had the very complex uh, histories with all our, our neighbors and there were big, big attempts to change that narrative so that we can um, live together with, uh, or the students can live together with these different sensitivities and with some uh, way to comprehend that uh, in the common Europe, right? So, and, but right now it is there are attempts to kind of renationalize the, um, uh, the agenda again. And there will be a struggle, right, between the two. And those who win, they will, you know, win for, for some time or even for, uh, for longer. And I obviously don't have the better um, answer to you how to stop that or besides of that they need to be some kind of the, at one hand, professional and on the other, on a democratic way of organizing that, how to teach the history of the schools and to have different sta stakeholders involved. But that's not very easy to do. If there are some people and some agents in the field who for whom the history is, as uh, my colleague in my institute, Michał Łuczewski says, it's kind of the moral capital. So they say the things they are right, and because they are right, they can rewrite the history books again, because 
because <laughs> that's the point. Oh, and this is, yeah, so this is where we can only you know, discuss the thing, try to explain our um, perspectives, but we might be just too weak for that. No. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Joanna. Um, I will not go now into further questions or comments. I'll just move directly to Kit and then uh, Nenad, and then uh, maybe we can have a discussion on, on um, everyone. Yes. Thanks. So I just, um, I, I should have said this. Uh, I think, um, I can't remember. I think Natalie already mentioned the French context uh, for the, um, restrictions on pluralism and uh, uh, how important government leaders can be. So for those of you who um, aren't following uh, US politics right now, um, one of the most recent um, of the many um, surprising turns in the President Trump's decision making has been a, a declaration of um, uh, a declaration of uh, unhappiness with the 1619 project, uh, which is a award winning effort led by some <laughs> uh, journalists to uh, th more systematically thread through uh, U.S. public understandings of the creation of the United States, the, the foundational role of slavery in that process, um, and in one of the latest um, efforts in the culture war, President Trump has uh, threatened uh, to withdraw um, public funding from any schools uh, using the 1619 project um, in their classrooms. So it's a kind of reminder that these are not just issues um, in the region that we're all interested in. Um, and just as a second note to that, if anyone can help me find the original reference, I thought it was uh, Kemal Kurspahic who's, who uh, um, made this commentary um, at the time of the, of the early 1990s. Uh, to a U.S. audience, he said, well, imagine if David Duke, the, um, um, the, the segregationist uh, leader in the U.S., imagine that he had controlled your media for the last 10 years. Um, and think about what, um, what relations between members of different groups would look like in the United States. And here we are 25 years later, and David Duke doesn't, hasn't controlled the media for 10 years, but um, it feels as if some of the messages being put out on US media are certainly feeding into um, the current conflicts um, in, in this country around the teaching of history and, uh, and understanding of plural narratives. Uh, so that said, this is my second um, uh, effort at microhistory and it speaks very much again to something uh, Natalie pointed out, the importance of family history. Um, and again, it's a, an effort to suggests that their uh, micro history and um, community history um, and a deeply grounded local history can actually sidestep um, the, the nation state. Um, so th this, this is a, but, but also I think one of the things we certainly as, a, as an outsider to the historical field, uh, to, to, the, to the use of archives, one of the challenges we grapple with is that states are producers of the raw material um, and states produce more documentation than, let's say, illicit insurgent organizations. They, they, they produce some of their own uh, documentation, uh, but they're not as scrupulous um, about it as states. Um, this is a, th these are a couple of documents, again, pulled off um, uh, accessible to anyone with an internet connection and a subscription to Ancestry.com. The, the resources that are now available, uh, for example, to track the immigration records um, through Ellis Island, where we can identify the ways in which um, uh, people originally, who, who's who are originally recorded as Macedonian uh, in terms of race or nationality 
when they arrive in Ellis Island, how in the, in the process of turning those statistics into mass data, that uh, initial in inscription is overwritten with Greek, Bulgarian, or Serbian. So we can do that now much more easily than having to go to DC. So again, I want to make an argument for the, the, uh, the, the, the positive potential of, um, uh, of internet access if we, can, if we can somehow persuade our 12-year-olds and our 15-year-olds that historical research is actually just as interesting and maybe more compelling than following the latest Twitter feed uh, from a politician, we've really got the opportunity to, uh, as historians and, and, and uh, scholars, to actually um, provide sort of fuel for curiosity and imagination that, that at the moment are being colonized by the emotional brokers who are our political leaders. So uh, what, I, what you have here are two documents um, from the life of Magdalena Dundoff. Um, so her marriage license to uh, Tashko Dundoff, um, a member of the Macedo Mas Bulgarian community in Steelton, Pennsylvania, um, from around the 1900 uh, through to his death in the 1940s. Um, and on the right is her death certificate, uh, where if you can see that um, the cause of death is the body was burnt by an explosion. Um, caused by the gasoline tank of an automobile, and it indicates it is accidental. Um, Tashko Dundoff was uh, detained um, for a while um, after his wife uh, burned in a car when he was completely unscathed um, in the early morning hours of September 1928, uh, less than a year after their marriage. and. Um, uh, less than three months after he had taken out a large life insurance policy on his wife and less than two weeks before a substantial debt that he owed uh, became due. Um, so he was detained briefly, but uh, released after legal investigation couldn't, um, couldn't provide evidence, couldn't provide firm evidence because the body had been so... Uh, um, uh, thoroughly destroyed by the fire, so there was no way to uh, to provide evidence that uh, Magdalena had in fact been rendered unconscious before she um, burnt to death in a car, um, again with her husband standing next to the car, um, unscathed. So it's a kind of interesting case of, um, for me, of a kind of historical detective case that we can get into, um, and what these documents tell us alongside uh, other documents that as historians we can access is that uh, Tashko Dundoff was um, uh, a prominent leader of the local chapter of the Macedonian political organization, uh, so heavily engaged in fundraising um, in the US in order to supply um, uh, material resources to the um, then revolutionary organization based in Bulgaria and, high, and very active in then South Serbia, including Dundoff's hometown of Prilep. So there's a kind of tangle history um, that runs through, um, runs through a community, a tight-knit community, where uh, Dundoff was able to uh, sort of, as both a political figure and a leader in the church, and as a businessman, was able to um, corral, was able to persuade people to stay quiet about things, and was able to get away with um, practices that, um, to our eyes, um, look, um, uh, well, which were deadly for those, for some people who crossed paths with him. So the key words here, I wanted to flag again, it's in the spirit, I mean, this is obviously our own version of cherry picking history, um, but, it's, but it's, a, it's a way from, that I think to, it, to sort of illuminate again that the, the, the transnational and the global are embedded in very local stories. Um, so here we have um, a, a community in Steelton largely comprised of 
um, migrants from the same town in 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 Macedonia, Prilep, um, who who brought who who, who married who and there were marriages outside the community. So uh, Magdalena was actually from um, Baranya, which was on the border of the Hung um, Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, she had worked as a cigar maker. She actually had her own house. Uh, so, that, but 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 she ends up dead and forgotten, um, and and her death goes um, unnoticed, um, and no one it, it, no one ever no one is ever held accountable for this. It's judged uh, accidental by a, a jury comprised of men. Um, and, uh, and, and influenced clearly by this, by, by the, by the local sway that Tashko Dundoff had created for himself. So it's a reminder of the ways that, um, j just the, 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 the long history of migration, displacement, um, the, 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 the place in economic life of the Western Balkans of labor migration and remittances and long distance connections as, as intimately woven into the fabric of life um, in ways that again sidestep or, or, or don't really take enormous account for long periods of modern history of uh, um, a national government. Um, in this particular case, um, it's, it's also a reminder that at times in its history, the Macedonian Revolution Organization um, was forced to operate as a criminal organization, uh, which put its leaders in the in in the precarious position um, of uh, of folks operating in a mafia-like structure. Um, and so there are ways in which this is a kind of intimate and possibly uncomfortable and, and possibly um, uh, seen as demeaning dimension of history. But there is nothing. Um, there's nothing distinctly Macedonian about this history. It's a it's a it's a it's a familiar history from organized crime in the United States. As with the with the story of the rifles, it's a reminder of these intimate connections and the ways that, um, as Seton Watson wrote in the 1930s, um, sort of violence has been pl plowed into. Um, the countries of the Western Balkans and for the people of the Western Balkans by forces outside uh, that region. Um, and so it's an it's a, it's a opportunity to, to recognize that and explore some of those stories. And again, I, I, I just finished by, by this discussion about textbooks. One of the things that I think I'm always, I, I, I studied um, hard sciences until I went to college and I remember the sort of sense of betrayal I had at age 18 when a, when a, when a science, when, 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 I, when I was first taught that electrons had mass. Um, in other words, as, as a 12 year old, I was taught that electrons were massless and as a, as a, because it's a simplified model of, of the atom, right? And, and we all accept that we give 12 year olds a more simplified model of how science works than we give university students. So I'm always curious what that, how we feel as historians about that relationship. At what point do we, you know, you, you, you can't hit the 10 year old with, well, you know, everything is multi-perspectival and, 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 and I, I, you know, before you, before, you, before you know where you're standing, let me cut the ice out from all around you. And, and see if you can swim, right? There's a kind of, there's, there's, a, there's a scaffolding that operates uh, when we teach science. And the question that I'm always struck by is how, what's the parallel for that in history? Like how, when, when and how is the time to complicate these narratives? Um, given, as various panelists have pointed out, the fact that we're, we're operating in a world where, where where the legitimacy of the authority, the scientific uh, um, expertise is continuously being challenged, right? Because history, it, it, when, we, when we introduce multiple perspectives, we're always told, oh, so there's no truth. So, the, you know, there's, the, so it doesn't matter, it's all relative. Um, and, that, and, and we see in various societies, including the US, the dangers and the ease with which um, 
with which politicians and other thought leaders can can kind of capitalize on that lack of critical thinking and capitalize on that kind of uh, assumption that if there's no one answer, then it's everything's up for grabs. Uh, and so that's the particular challenge in the interface that I think a number of you have discussed is this issue of professional history, um, the history, the history that people tell each other it, within their families and the histories that, um, the takes on history that get promoted by particular kinds of regime, um, and and how to what the what the place of thinking about scaffolding in particular and 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 carving out uh, the 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 position that just because there's no single narrative that doesn't mean there's there's no rigor and no kind of basis for the arguments that we're making. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Keith. Uh, I'll move for right away to Nenad, uh, and then, um, uh, yeah, then we can have the last question. But first, Nenad, please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> yes, I would uh, also say, um, um, or also turn um, um, to, to to the local. I think there is this is very productive. Um, focusing on the local, maybe not um, calling it transnational, but beyond national um, or concerning um, the relation um, between the national state who tries uh, to nationalize society, because we also have, to, I mean, this is self-understanding, but maybe I should mention it nevertheless, to, to have in mind that there, there is every time a tension between um, the actors, the protagonists of the nation state and society. It's never identical. Society and nation states are not the same. And um, um, this was for me in my field work in this local context on the both sides of the Serbian Bulgarian border, very, very visible. And um, also concerning remembrance because um, um, in my field research or my book about this border region, um, it became clear to me that a large part of the individuals of the local society denies themselves any meaning, especially with regard to history. Um, their own experiences, the experiences of friends and relatives are seen as worthless and irrelevant with regard to the great Bulgarian, great Serbian history. They, they remain in a subaltern, subaltern or ambiguous sphere. And I think this is not only characteristic of this region, but it's characteristic for several regions in the Balkans. But um, this was really interesting to me that um, they say um, the perception is uh, shaped that by the fact that there are people from the periphery, they are not part of this great history, we have nothing to say, is often said. And in addition, for example, I would just turn really shortly to um, the um, period of the split of Yugoslavia from uh, the Soviet bloc in 1948, which, which was um, very, had very severe also uh, consequences in this region. Um, many traumatizing experiences are additionally blocked uh, precisely on the basis of conviction of their own irrelevance. We have nothing to say. And there is no public space for this personal stories, for this familiar, for, for, for this family stories. And um, as I said, this became clear to me when I, uh, when it came to the time of IB, when I talked uh, with the people, um, where this border villages um, had much to suffer, and mostly nobody wanted to tell about it. Only, only, and this was very interesting with the new possibility of rehabilitation for the victims of the so-called Inform Bureau, uh, which was introduced in Serbia before some years ago, then um, there was a possibility developing to articulate this traumatizi traumatizing experiences of these people and who at that time experienced this as children, how fathers, et cetera, relatives were taken away and were permanently stigmatized after their return from uh, Goli or from other um, 
uh, prisons. So um, I think what what is really really um, not only in this area uh, and this region important is a, fo a critical focus, critically thinking, critically thinking focus on local history. And from there, you can um, develop the tensions which are every time connected with um, this national framing. And this is also important for me because uh, <clears throat> to create this space and the self-confidence for such stories because they will disappear eventually. Uh, they will be forgotten. And after that, all that is left is a state-centered con state -state construction of history that does not refer to any experience and is completely abstract towards it. And um, the forgetting of this very concrete stories of very concrete people, this is something um, we have to work with uh, because to, 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 to give history not only this reified um, shape as it has in the national uh, context by by this protagonists of the national state. So this will be a very short reflection. I hope it's not too mis misunderstanding on this uh, question. Thank you very much, Nenad. Um, I think once again, uh, uh, we heard about the importance of marginalized stories, of stories that are not, vo not vocalized in, uh, in official history teaching or official uh, public uh, presentations of history. And um, yeah, what several times uh, you, but also I think Natalie mentioned the importance of critical thinking that doesn't, uh, and, and that again can be only achieved through what uh, Eckhart said, through multi-perspectivity and multi-perspectivity has to include uh, different perspectives, but not just uh, histories of different, for example, nationalities or ethnicities living in one country, but also what uh, many of you mentioned, family stories or individual stories. Um, and that, co that, that comes across to me as a very important, for me personally, conclusion from this round of, of, of comments, the importance of critical thinking as, 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 a, as a very important component for the whole education, but in history uh, in particular. Uh, and uh, I only would like to say, uh, I also agree with, with Natalie on, when she said that revisionism is not, is not, is not necessarily uh, attached or to kind of transnational ways of, of, of thinking about history or strategics, but uh, research, doing history research. And in fact, the case of Macedonia, for example, and now what's happening uh, with the history commissions, it's actually a kind of reverse project. It, it is a way of revisiting history books by historical commissions, but it's not a transnational approach at all. Actually, it is the opposite. It is, um, it, it is kind of a, a of negotiation process, which I think it's, um, it has, I, I'm, I think it can be very pessimistic that can be successful because there are very clear national agendas there and also some kind of a power positions in, included where one country might be in a better position than the other because uh, in, in this case Macedonia wants to enter EU and need to be given access so and so there has to be negotiation and uh, on, on historical issues which are not just something left to the uh, public or to the politicians, but really they are directly decisive kind of they 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 are um, involved in that decision making about concrete concrete political processes and EU integration processes. Um, uh, I, there's not much time uh, to discuss this, but I really would like to hear what is your opinion on how d historical commissions how this um, worked in the past and how this history wars, which also uh, somebody mentioned it before, how could they be solved? And if I can move now also to the third question, what are the escape routes of processes where um, exchange between intellectuals across Europe, different regions, will not end into ethno-nationalism, but rather the opposite, will open routes for transnational research. And uh, I'm afraid that what's happening at the moment with the Macedonian Greek and Macedonian Bulgarian commissions, it's exactly the opposite. It's not opening a space for transnational research, it's actually the opposite. It is uh, guarding the, your own containers of, uh, of, of, of national uh, uh, historical knowledge. Um, 
so how do you see that cooperation in future how do you see what are the possible pathways uh, to have kind of a more uh, constructive uh, historical discussions across europe to achieve what is the european goal of shared heritage or shared heritage shared histories uh, and so on uh, i would leave now the floor open whoever wants to start first uh, and then we can move uh, to the next yes eckhart please go ahead thank you very much i just want to take up your <clears throat> your reference to the history commission uh, uh, we see in this particular case of course the, the the restraints right and the problems that are connected with that but on the other hand to me they are also not a solution but a good way out um uh, and as an escape route as you as you mentioned in in, in your question what i what i mean with that uh, what i mean with that is um researching transnational uh, also implies to me doing transnational and that is not only uh, confined to professional elite historians just let me give you a, a few examples when i talk when, when, I, when i mean we should be transnational means to me using and even founding uh, uh, trans or international organizations or using ex ex existence and, and existing networks because they bring together first of all different stakeholders from different countries uh, be it civil society be it professionals be it political stakeholders they produce common material i will say a little bit more about it and they provide the data that is necessary uh, to have a multi-perspective narrative i have to know other narratives right before i can even think about it um, and when it comes to history teaching and um, textbook revision talking about objects and material uh, then there are of course different levels there are these bilateral commissions i mean it's a history commission but what they deal is of course also with textbooks and how uh, these 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 contested uh, so to say interpretations of history can be or cannot be uh, included in, in textbooks we have regional activities and we have global global activities and just to give you a few examples on the on the non-governmental level there are networks that exist and it can be used your clio and your your everybody probably um, uh, knows it um, the european association of history teachers who have been a tremendous work when it comes to the revision of textbooks on the bilateral and multilateral level. There are national institutions like my institute who have been engaged for, for, for decades in those activities. And coming back to you, Joanna, because I know this Polish case you mentioned before, the revisionist uh, uh, um, um, reform in, in Poland, because we just, we just finished the fourth volume of a common German-Polish history textbook, which actually has a transnational and multi-perspective uh, perspective. It's very, it will be very complicated to, to get it into Polish schools in, in Germany, it's a, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit easier. But we have other cases, um, and we have the the the, the Israel uh, Palestinian uh, uh, common textbook that was written by by teachers. Uh, we have in, in 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 East Asia where we have the history forum that was established in two thousand and three, and they, these the, this was civil society. This this was they were mainly teachers and some professors. No money, no budget, nothing. Local historians and not like <laughs> I'm sorry for coming up with that, Johanna. Again, no elitaire cosmopolitan historians who, who who are well funded. No, and and they do. They they came up with the transnational and textbook on transnational history of East Asia new approaches and, and of course that's the first step i mean the second step is of course to somehow get it into schools and and train teachers to use these new pers perspectives um so these are a lot of activities and they, they can be used and, and and i know they exist in the balkan too and some of them are successful some of them are less successful in the case you just mentioned uh, of course this this historical commission because it's political misused right and and what i talk is more the civil society bottom up non state um um guided uh, 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 work uh, just let me give you two last example and then i stop on a governmental level uh, in europe uh, the council of europe has established or is about to establish a history observatory for peace in europe um uh, with the uh, goal to promote European values and to develop a European conscious with, with reports, with recommendations, with textbook analysis, with the analysis of, of practices of historical teaching in European countries. Uh, we don't know how it goes and where it goes, 
but by now 21 uh, European countries um, have, have have signed uh, that uh, um, an enlarged partial agreement. But that's a that's a state initiative, so we have to know uh, what we do right now. Here at my institute, and I just mentioned it was one sentence. We are about to establish a European forum for reconciliation and cooperation in history and social sciences, where we try to bring together those several you know activities by or multilateral activities in Europe to bind them together maybe to develop standards to find ways how to overcome the, these, the, the, these problems we have when it comes to to these contested memories and how they can find their way in, in textbooks and ideally uh, then in the in the classroom thank you thank you uh, thank you uh, Eckhart Natalie I see uh, wants to yes um. Yes, uh, I want to uh, tackle another issue the, uh, that seems to me uh, important because also of some remarks that were made before, the issue of the narrative, even of the form of the narrative. Uh, we said that, we, we spoke about, uh, so I think uh, Joanna and Keith about emotions uh the fact that uh uh history should be attractive also through emotions uh and that also the uh the narrative uh, has to be uh as not too complex uh in order to be understandable so i think that uh for historians, people who uh, were writing textbooks and others, maybe the main, one of the main issue uh, is the issue of the narrative. And, uh, and I, maybe uh, the, uh, the circulation of, uh, of models can be uh, also of uh, um, a certain, uh, uh, utility, uh, for example, uh, in uh, again in France, excuse me, <laughs> uh, uh, three years ago, appeared a book uh, that uh, produced a polemic. In fact, it was the uh, the book edited by uh, uh, Boucheron and uh, others, uh, uh, entitled L'Histoire uh, Mondiale de la France, so the, the World History of France. And, the, uh, and in fact, the polemics were, was between these historians and, so let's say transnational historians, but uh, other historians that were not revisionist at all in a way. They, they were the people around the, uh, the, the, the book uh, Les Lieux de Mémoire, so a very important book. Uh, so, uh, so it's more complicated, but what also the uh, Boucheron and the, his colleagues uh, did, it was to, uh, uh, to structure the book uh, around dates, dates. So uh, 1492, for example, and, and so to explain history, so the, 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 um, the, the world dimension of French history through dates. Uh, so here the narrative is quite uh, simple. And I think we'll see also that another phenomenon, because we spoke about historians, we spoke about political leaders, uh, uh, we spoke about uh, the, so the public opinion, but and what about the um, uh, the writers, the novelists, for example? You have in the in the last years several examples of very important book uh, that brought. Uh, important contribution to the field of history, but that were written by novelists. So people like, for example, uh, Javier Cercas, uh, the, the, the Spanish uh, author. Uh, lastly, uh, this uh, Italian writer, uh, Scurati, 
who wrote um, a biography of, uh, uh, began to, uh, to write a biography of Mussolini. And so this, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, there is a debate on the, uh, you know, the relation between the fiction and the history. And uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, very uh, related to uh, what we are trying to uh, uh, to imagine as uh, solutions also for changing and uh, proposing new uh, uh, way of uh, disseminating a, a more uh, complex uh, in the content content but not in the form. Thank you, Natalie. Um, uh, who, who would like uh, to go next uh, uh, with a final remark, I would say, and, uh, oh, uh, um, yes. Just a last uh, point. Uh, uh, also, they are, uh, as an historian, uh, in historian, I, I just, I am trying now to uh, also to propose something maybe a, a bit new. Uh, in, in my last book that I am uh, finishing now uh, on uh, the building of a nation state, so the Albanian nation state in the 1920s and 1930s, and through uh, a prison, a triple uh, prison, space, time, and trajectories. So here we have again the uh, the uh, the, the 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 yeah the attempt to grasp history through the personal trajectories but not only also also the issue of time with multiple temporalities and also of spaces with uh, also the uh, entanglement of uh, of different spaces so it's another attempt thank you uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, if uh, uh, Joanna, uh, would you like to go next with the next final remark? And then uh, Lena and Kit, and after that, I would like to open the floor for at least 10 minutes to have for uh, the audience also to engage. Thank you. Yeah, just maybe very, very briefly referring to that, what Kis was saying, because I really like that ma metaphor, <laughs> if I might say, or a question. How can we, I mean, what can we use with the example of teaching science <laughs> in school uh, when we transfer that to, to history? Because that would, I mean, your example, if I understood it well, would imply that, uh, okay, they teach it in a simplified way, <laughs> the model which later um, you, can, uh, um, uh, you can grasp in more details. My question to you as a historian would be, do we really need to teach them? Because what would be that, that thing which we need to teach them? Is it a narrative? So do we need to really teach them a narrative? If not, and we, it's enough to teach them an approach, right? Which is a critical approach or the, the so-called multi-perspective or um, agonistic approach. Then, then there's, there's only a question of uh, um, uh, which level we practice that approach. We can do it as you argue and the local approach, we can do it on some other scale. Probably the local is the most uh, easy to grasp and to involve the people with. Then obviously it's a question if then there are certain new the memoir which still the, at the nation level or some other level, European level, whatever, global level, we want the people to grasp in. Our, can we afford that they do not know who was, who Martin Luther King was, like that, or Robert Schumann was, or the first King of Poland was. Maybe in the time of Wikipedia we can, right? So that maybe it's just the approach is enough. And then also my other question, I think to uh, just, an open question or an open remark to that, because we have a lot discussed this transnational and uh, multi-ethnic perspective, but there, there are the other others <laughs> around us which are being forgotten uh, by the history, which is mainly still in the handbooks, most of the handbooks, um, especially in Eastern Europe, very politically oriented. So like well, gender history, right? Uh, that's something which we can do and we can also practice this on the, on the local level and if we open that perspective to the other and that 
your perspectives and maybe it's easier when they grow up to you know to open the um the scope of the understanding and also the uh the thing that the the <laughs> The history is a narrative. <laughs> it's making the narrative, and they have to be critical about uh, that uh, the, the narratives and look for the narratives of the uh, of the others. So yeah, that's my final statement before the discussion. But I really would like to answer one of the Michelle's questions later on, which is great. Yes, uh, as you can see, there are already questions coming in. Michele already posted one. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much for bringing the other others, which I think also very important. Um, Nenat, uh, do you want to uh, say your final remark? And answer to My final remark. <clears throat> Encouraging subjectivity, of course. I mean, uh, subjectivity in the sense of the possibility of critical judgment. I think this is very general, and I would like to begin with it or to do this very local. Uh, in my case, um, I think what, what is very important is for the, for example, cooperation of um, muse local museums on both sides of any kind, of any any borders in, in the Balkans, because the people on both sides have the same experiences, but they often do not know about it. And um, um, I think this this is something um, we, where you can start with. Uh, uh, kids from school, that they can learn something about their family. They maybe didn't know until now because it was not a vogue to talk about such things. And, which, and when such kind of space emerges, um, also this kind of subjectivity emerges. And I would just like to add something. I think uh, literature can be really, 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 really inspiring for us. Um, and just as this approach of subjectivity, I don't know, um, Milan Kujergovic, for example, a writer from Sarajevo now in Zagreb, he, he, he wrote a great book before some years, Rod, on Serbo Croatian or Croatian, uh, however. And um, I don't know if there is, it is in, translated um, in, in English, but in German it is. It has the really not very inspiring title of The, uh, the Unheard uh, History of My Family. Um, but nevertheless, and this is really good because um, it shows um, in, an, in a really long time span how is uh, it possible to, to live with ambiguities. Yeah, if something, someone is not part of this nation, but is just a kuferash, how it's called, coming from somewhere else to live uh, uh, in this place. And I think this is something which can us uh, inspire to tackle this commissions and um, and to have some kind of energy um, to, to keep our nerves then in this um, talks um, and negotiations. So these are my final words. That's, that's very nice. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, Kit. Yes, I just, uh, yes. I, my, my third slide was, um, as you would have anticipated, about the Vefchani work, um, but I won't, uh, I won't uh, go into that in the same depth. But just uh, I'd like to, first of all, thank everyone. And also, uh, I just put in the chat, if Natalie and Nana, can you share the book references you both mentioned? Just because I'd love to follow up on those. Um, uh, I know, I, I hope we'll address uh, Michelle's questions more fully, um, but I'm just... I'm very conscious in the um, victim perpetrator frame uh, of, uh, as Johanna said, the other others. So teaching in a state where Arizona, where the, 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 the realities of US settler colonialism and the uh, price exacted uh, from people, indigenous inhabitants and people of color in the forging of America makes the victim perpetrator frame, uh, a, a, um, it's, it's going to be a long uh, road to uh, persuade uh, U.S. public, the, 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 the diminishing demographic of folks who have lived comfortably in their white privilege their whole lives. Uh, to uh, come to terms with that. So again, just flagging that these are not just issues in the region. Um, and then the last thing, just, uh, just I would add to subjectivity, and it's a little bit of a response to Joanna's uh, question. 
I mean, for me, I, as, as, as my historian colleagues in Skopje consistently point out to me, I'd really, I'd really rather be writing novels. Um, and uh, for me, it's, it's, it's all about sparking the imagination, but sparking the cognitive imagination to, uh, so history, particular capacity to provoke habits of cognitive empathy. And, and that does pose a challenge because I don't see, I think people talk about empathy as a scalar. That is, you, we just, we build, more, we, we ideal, we, we have a notion that we just fill people up with more and more empathy. Um, but for me, especially as an anthropologist who was reared on um, Benedict Anderson's imagined communities, right? Which, which made its way into historical discussion as well. Um, empathy has vectors. Um, and so the two truths, um, living with two truths that Nana just flagged is part of the human condition, which is we can be incredibly uh, connected with people who somehow we think of as having experiences like us. Uh, at the same time as being tremendously disconnected or seeing those uh, that experience of closeness as threatened if we try and expand it out in new directions. Uh, but that for me is the, the challenge of this notion of, of like, you know, where the, I, I'm going to know more about this phantom borders work, but where the, where the borders of the human imagination are, are they in the same, does everyone have the potential to transcend them? Um, and, and, you know, is, 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 are there enough emotional and material resources whereby yeah, history can be, um, history doesn't, we, we don't need to cut it up into pieces that different people possess wholly for themselves. Uh, but rather we imagine it as a shared resource from which everyone can draw. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of fantasy utopian land, but that seems to me the project that we, we should be engaged on. And for me, I, I'm, I'm endlessly encouraged by the fact that, that I, I find some of the most humane, connected um, and empathic people who I've ever met uh, live in a small village in Western Macedonia and are continuing to struggle towards a kind of more just and fair world in which this, there are, in which it matters what actually happened in 1987 um, and 1968 and 1948. It, it matters uh, and they know um, and, 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 and sort of embrace and, and what, what they demonstrate to me is it's actually much easier to if, if you sort of commit to telling tr truth rather than lies you it's it just makes for a much simpler life um, and I think politicians especially in the US could learn from that thank you so much Kate for this uh, final remark uh, um, uh, I think it was a beautiful closure, uh, including empathy and uh, seeing uh, history as a shared source that everybody can draw from rather than uh, something that uh, needs to be cut and everybody needs to own a piece of it. Uh, if you allow me now, I uh, would like to open out the floor for uh, several questions. And as I said, we already have a question from Michele. Uh, I'll read it loud. Uh, it says it's to Nenad and others. While dealing with the past involving victims and perpetrators, we deal with, we deal with facts, memory, history in um, interconnected, even contrasting, contrasted triangle. How would you see these three concepts? Uh, Camus says there is one truth, but the truth has multiple faces. What else? Oh, what else besides multi-perspectivity and critical thinking? I think this is the second question. I'll read it also, and then later maybe you can. Uh, what else besides multi-perspectivity and critical thinking towards his history would contribute to inclusive, constructive culture of remembrance? Did do novels, movies, songs, theater plays uh, 
not make more for reconciliation than history we teach in schools. Uh, anybody wants to answer the questions? Or uh, the first one I think was to Nenad, but also the others. So. I think we, we um, I think this is a very, very uh, important reflection, and I think we answered it also uh, quite a bit uh, concerning literature, and this counts also for other other um, moments of art and. Um, um, uh, in con concerning this famous German word Verarbeitung um, of history. Uh, processing is something um, not really adequate, but uh, maybe a kind of translation for this. Yes, I mean, um, it is not only um, a task of history, and this is, as I wanted to point out, uh, something um, uh, which needs an, an approach to, uh, to society and to reflect on um, um, yeah, relations of power in, in society and um, history is only a modest part in my view um, to, to, to offer um, research to encourage some, some such discussions. Thank you, Leonard. I see Natalie wants to say something and then Eckhart. Uh, a brief um add to what I already said, it's uh, maybe we, uh, that uh, the fact that maybe we forgot the media because in uh, uh, this uh, power relationship, I think that uh, we have also the media that are playing uh, an important role. Uh, and the second uh, point is that, um, uh, so I spoke about uh, literature, but uh, cinema is also very uh, important. And I want to uh, mention uh, the work of uh, Peter Watkins. I don't know if you have heard about this uh, filmmaker. Uh, and it's related to my first point because it's uh, someone who uh, from the 1970s uh, uh, on uh, produced uh, and realized uh, uh, very important films about the problem of, uh, um, of, of uh, uh, memory, history and power and medias. And uh, he, for example, he uh, uh, did a film on the Battle of Culloden uh, in, uh, in uh, Great Britain. So when the, uh, it was at the end of, uh, of Scotland, I think. Um, and uh, in this film, in fact, he is interviewing uh, people uh, who uh, are fighting on the battlefield. So it tries to give off, it's a fiction, of course, because <laughs> uh, uh, he, he could not uh, go back to, uh, to history, but he's giving uh, the, uh, the possibility to speak to the subalterns, the people who are fighting and why they are fighting. So they are, ask the people, why are you fighting? And one is saying, because I just followed my brother or because of this or because of that. So, and here it gives to us uh, to, to, to see uh, the, the multiplicity of, uh, of, uh, of the reality or of the truth, if you want to speak about truth. So I, please, have a look at all the films of, uh, of Peter Watkins. Thank you, Natalie. Eckhart, uh, you, uh, you wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah thanks. Coming back to the, to the, to the question, I would, I would like to respond to that as much as I can. Uh, uh, besides multi-perspectivity and critical thinking, well, these are skills that are already very, very difficult to learn. And most of us will uh, probably will have 
work on that until the rest of our life. Another category I can think of, and that links up to what we talked about emotions before, is empathy. I think empathy is a is a, is a very important skill when you talk about history, and especially in a in a in a transnational perspective. Other ways of um, uh, then about uh, these novels and 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 plays and 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 other forms that can contribute to. Uh, um, reconciliation. Well, I don't know. There are no studies. We don't know what is more effective. No, no, no answer with that. But what I want to say is, of course, there are many ways of creating memory and, and the public, the media, the family, uh, um, uh, novels, movies, uh, textbooks, um, and, and, but they all, and that is very important, I want to say is they all have a narrative. And it might be a national narrative or the other one. So when we talk about like a national narrative, we don't talk about like the chronology of some kind of nation from its founding to the present present term. Narratives can be can you know as, as a single image contains a narrative, a novel contains a narrative, a, a movie contains a narrative, and we have to deconstruct that when we talk about narratives. And and in that respect. You know, textbooks don't differ when we talk about narratives, not much from novels or, or, or comics or whatever, because they all have implicit narratives in there. The particularity of textbooks compared to other media, say movies and, um, and novels, is that in most countries of the world, every, every person, every student has to read a textbook if he or she likes it or not. But reading a novel, reading or, 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 or watching a movie, it's very individual. You can do it. You don't have to a textbook you have in your hand and of course there has been discussions for for decades how effective textbooks are and we already we know we have known for a long time that the contents of textbooks does not end up in the brain of the student that there are so many different layers in between we all know that um, uh, but yet those narratives when we talk about national transnational or some other narratives every medium whatever we look at uh, it contains that uh, last thing what what um, what joanna asked like what is in the textbooks do they learn about should teach, um, students learn about luther or schumann or, or you you take it right here my answer would be well this is exactly the result of negotiations in society that that should be the result it's not should not be a single politician that decides well we don't teach colonialism anymore Right, like in France, where we had this huge debate in, in a couple of years ago, or we don't do this, or I want to have this in there, I want to have only kings, whatever it is. No, it should be the result of a negotiation process of a lot of stakeholders in one society. And then they come to a result. Do they want to teach Luther or not? And they will have an answer for that. But there's no general answer. So I wouldn't say everybody should <laughs> learn about Luther or Schumann. That would be my response to your, to your question, Joanna. Thank you. Uh, I see Joanna. Yes. Yeah, if I could just quickly come back to the Michelle's first questions, which I really like, which was why dealing with the past involving victims and perpetrators, we deal with facts, memory, history in an interconnected, even contrasted triangle. How would you see these three concepts? And uh, I, I just want to recall uh, the, the very beautiful notion by James Wirch, who is the um, uh, social psychologist, but he dealt with the, he, also, he actually analyzed a lot of the, the post-Soviet Union and Russian textbooks looking for the, something which we called master narrative behind them. And uh, he says, and that's, application of that research and also other other research he he did he says that it's a kind of easier that, that it's even possible to agree for the uh, for the conflicting parties to agree on the facts but they might not agree on the narrative <laughs> and the narrative will be always kind of behind and lagging behind that so when we have the cases like Yedwabna in Poland or Babi Yar in Ukraine where the local population was involved uh, in the um, killing uh, of uh, Jewish populations or uh, so, you know the at, at the end of the historical com commission and other people who saying they finally we agree okay so that, that number of the people actually died there. But still, <laughs> then there is a narrative behind that. 
And even if they agree about the identity of the perpetrators and the victims, the, each of the each of the side might st st uh, of the conflicting side of that might might start the story somewhere else. So let's say, well, there were some Poles involved, but generally that was the occupied Poland, so Germans were there, so they're guilty. <laughs> and then the other points will say this, no, that that has been that eternal Polish Catholic anti-Semitism, which actually, the, you know, put that uh, event into motion. And this is what he calls mnemonic standoff. So it's not about the fact, but it's about the narratives which are behind the facts and which uh, can both use actually the same facts, but they would be very, uh, very different. Yeah. So Thank that's... you. Thank you very much, Joanna. We are running a little bit out of time, and uh, but I do want to do justice to also the other participants. So if there is any other burning question, I would like to ask the uh, participants to actually unmute themselves and uh, they can address the question directly to the panelists. Uh, 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 so please, uh, uh, whoever wants to ask question, uh, go ahead. Uh, I think we have uh, time for maybe one or maximum two questions. Hello, good evening. Um, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good evening. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for organizing uh, this discussion. It's uh, very interesting to listen to all of you. But I have one question um, since we, I'm studying human rights in, uh, and democracy in Southeast Europe. And um, I have a question actually concerning um, wider European context, so beyond South uh, Eastern Europe, because we were tackling uh, several issues and uh, also transi um, transnational justice and transitional justice. So I would like to ask you concerning this wider European concept as already context as already said and the process of reconciliation um, is it possible that in the those societies with political transitions where transitional justice has provided opportunities to address past human um, rights abuses, mass atrocities, or other forms of severe trauma to facilitate, um, let's say, smooth transition into a more democratic or a peaceful uh, future. So is it possible to apply and accomplish, at least at some extent, and at what extent as well is the question, uh, full reconciliation with understanding torture, um, enforced uh, disappearance in the past, and uh, um, and um, to enable memorialization in the future. So is it possible in those societies to achieve full reconciliation under all of these circumstances? Thank you, Ayla. Is there anybody in particular that you would Thank like you. to Thank you. Uh, do you do you, uh, do you address the question to somebody in particular? Uh, no, because uh, all of the panelists are from um, very interesting backgrounds. So I would like to hear all of them if they are interested to answer this uh, question. And thank you so much. Okay, I would like only to kindly ask you to keep it a bit brief uh, because we're really out of time now. So yes, whoever feels inspired to answer the question. Kit, yes. And then uh, Eckhart. So that's a, that's a huge and tough question. Uh, one of the things that it makes me think about in connection with some of the other panelists is just to, 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 what, to, to what extent we think that the work of the historian is to provide closure. Um, because that's clearly a kind of justice centered narrative uh, is, is the, 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 the shape of a judicial narrative is judgment um, and, 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 uh, and a sort of finality to that. Um, and for me, at least, the, if, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we allow our historical work to be um, if we prioritize framing our historical work in that, uh, in that modality, in other words, with the idea of coming up with the answer 
which 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 assigns responsibility and and uh, and reckoning and reparations um, then we are kind of surrendering a, a, a kind of piece of the epistemological space of what some of us are trying to do which is provoke openness and sort of ironically sort of future facing um, uh, openness and critical thinking so critical thinking in order to recognize multiple perspectives so so the the I, I hear heard what you say there's a kind of the, the, there is a sort of difference between the truth and reconciliation mode modality and the um, justice modality um, but I think that the, the work of um, transnational history, at least for me, is, is, is sits a little bit outside that frame. Okay, okay thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kate. Uh, uh, Eckhart, uh, I think uh, you wanted to also yeah, say something. Just two sentences because of the, of the time constraints. Yes. We have here. Um, um, I think in those uh, truth and reconciliation uh, committees that exist in, in a variety of countries, we know it of course from South Africa and, and, and Latin America in, in many cases, historians play a major role. I mean, they are, they are very decisive um, um, actors uh, in, in those commissions, but those commission, commissions also show the limitations of historians, how far they can go. They can find, uh, let's say, the truth that comes in many faces, but let's say the truth, uh, but it needs uh, to come in, in society to, to, to really, if to reach justice and reconciliation, it needs the political will. And that uh, there I see very much limitations of, of, of historians because no matter how true the accounts are of those, uh, of those commissions, if there's no political will uh, to basically incorporate it in, in, in different areas of, of, of society and education is certainly one museums whatever you, you can name it uh, without political will I, I don't think there's 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 any uh, success but even if there's a political will when we talk about it we talk about a long time and patience that's nothing that can be reached in in a few years but but you're an expert you study it so I, I don't have to tell you that thank you uh, thank you very much uh, uh, we're 15 minutes over time, um, and uh, I actually would love to accept even more questions if there are any, but uh, yes, since we're running late, I actually would like to conclude the discussion for today, and I would like to thank um, everybody who joined us for the, for the discussion, both on Zoom, but also on our YouTube channel. And uh, I, of course, particularly would like to thank all our panelists today who took the time and uh, I, I, I'm really grateful for the very valuable contributions. I believe we not just addressed some very important issues, but also we opened some very, um, very important and crucial questions. Uh, the, actually, the discussion will continue tomorrow with the second panel, where we're going to zoom in um, more into the Southeastern European context. And I would like to invite everybody of you uh, who would like to continue the discussion, who has questions, uh, also to or, or just to listen please uh, join us uh, tomorrow for the second uh, panel uh, thank you again everybody uh, for your very kind contributions and uh, i hope to see you in some other opportunity maybe in life one day <laughs> thank you very much have a nice evening uh, greetings from skopje thank you bye thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go well.